Hello, everyone. This is Dave Iverson. Thanks for joining us today. I'm the Foundation's contributing editor and the moderator for today's Third Thursday webinar. Um, as we hope you know, every Third Thursday is when we put together these discussions about topics that are important to the Parkinson's community. They take place at 12 noon Eastern, which is a great time, except for today, of course, when it conflicts with the beginning of the NCAA basketball tournament, but we'll move on to the next topic. <laughs> the last. Um, we do hope you will mark your calendar and, and join us um, throughout the year. Um, you'll be able to submit questions throughout the hour, uh, and our experts will be uh, available to answer them. You'll see the Q&A box that's on the right side of your screen. So just uh, type in your questions there, and we will try to get to as many of those as we can. Those of you who are veterans of our Third Thursday webinar series know, though, that we will not get uh, to all of them. And so in recent months, we We've also added uh, a new feature, which we're excited about, which is that at 12 noon Eastern on Friday, tomorrow, we'll continue uh, the conversation on Twitter. Uh, just use the hashtag FoxPDChat. Um, and Dr. Rachel Dolan from the Michael J. Fox Foundation staff will be available to answer additional um, questions that we don't get to today about deep brain stimulation and other uh, surgical treatments for Parkinson's as well. Um, last, before we get started, um, we're also going to make available the slides from today's webinar for download. So you'll see a box uh, called resource list on the right, and you can just uh, click on that, and the document will open in your browser, and you'll be able to save or print your slides from there. Okay, so let's get started with our topic today. Here's what we're going to be um, focusing on. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the various uh, surgical intervention possibilities for uh, Parkinson's uh, disease. The most commonly known, of course, is deep brain stimulation, or DBS, and we'll talk about both the current state of DBS and what it provides, but also some really interesting things that are going on in terms of research that may improve uh, DBS and that hopefully in time will allow DBS to be something that can treat uh, additional symptoms, that it is not as effective at treating for Parkinson's as well. But DBS, of course, isn't the only uh, surgical intervention that's possible, or, or, uh, and there are others. And one of the really intriguing new ones is a bit almost like surgery without surgery, which is focused ultrasound that is now under research and development. It's an intriguing uh, technique, and we're going to uh, spend some time talking about that later in our hour as well. Um, let's meet um, who's going to be joining us today for our discussion. Um, joining us are Kevin Kwok, who ha had uh, it's a part, someone who lives with Parkinson's and had uh, DBS uh, surgery in November of 2013. Kevin, thanks for being part of our, our session today. It's a pleasure being here. And joining us as well is Dr. Jamie Henderson. He is the Director of Stereotactic and Functional Neurosurgery, Professor of Neurosurgery at Stanford University, among other things. Also, Kevin's uh, surgeon who performed the DBS uh, procedure for him. Uh, Dr. Henderson, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dave. Looking forward to the discussion. And also uh, joining us uh, later in the hour, well, he'll, he's joining us now, but we'll hear from him later in the hour, Dr. Neil Cassell. He's professor of neurosurgery at the University of Virginia and founder and chairman of Focused Ultrasound Foundation. And he'll be the one about halfway through our hour today where we'll dig into what Focused Ultrasound actually is and what uh, researchers hope it will provide to people with Parkinson's. Uh, in hopefully the not too distant uh, future. Dr. Cassell, thanks also for being part of our program. You're very welcome. Pleased to be part of it. Thank you. All right. Well, let's dig right into what we know about uh, deep brain stimulation, uh, what it is, and what researchers are, are working on to improve it. So, Dr. Henderson, we see on the screen right now this uh, uh, a series of bullet points about what deep brain stimulation is, that it provides electrical stimulation to certain areas of the brain, that it can have a great impact for people with Parkinson's, particularly effective at treating certain symptoms, not as effective right now at least at, at, at treating um, some others. And you can see the diagram that, that on, the, on the screen that illustrates um, what it is. 
but this is sometimes referred to as like a pacemaker for the brain. Is that a useful way of thinking about it? Tell us exactly what that electrical current is doing and why it is effective at it moderating at least some of the symptoms of Parkinson's. Yeah, thanks, Dave. So uh, I think that is an apt description of what deep brain stimulation is uh, because the, the brain, very much like the heart, runs on rhythms. Your brain synchronizes various areas in order to engage motor systems to be able to move your body through three-dimensional space. And in Parkinson's disease, the lack of dopamine, uh, while of course this is a chemical problem in the brain, also affects the electrical activity. So both chemicals and electricity are intimately tied together in brain functioning. The lack of dopamine in Parkinson's disease leads to abnormal rhythms in the brain, which we're just now beginning to learn more and more about. And so I think it really is an apt description uh, to call uh, DBS a pacemaker for the brain because it normalizes these abnormal rhythms in the brain. So if it's true that Parkinson's is in essence an electrical disorder, not just a, a biochemical one, what is it that the current's doing? And why would it be effective at uh, moderating tremor, for example, not so great at let's say, improving balance. Does that mean that there is an electrical malfunction that's specific to tremor uh, that's different for perhaps other symptoms, and that's why the current is effective for one kind of symptom, less so for another? Well, you know, Dave, that, that's kind of a $64,000 question, and uh, a lot of research is being currently focused on these areas, trying to understand um, you know, what it is about various different types of um, uh, simulation patterns that might help one symptom more or less than another. Uh, we, we think that uh, some of it has to do with the location of the DBS electrode in the brain and which circuits that DBS electrode is affecting. Um, but uh, but the, the jury is still out in terms of really understanding the mechanism. It's, it probably has to do with a with a, affecting large areas of the brain and, and large areas of circuitry. And that's why DBS can be so effective because mm -hmm. By targeting one very small area in the brain, uh, one can affect large, large portions of, uh, of brain tissue. And why would it be that DBS is effective? We often hear this. It's effective for basically the same thing that dopamine replacement theory is, uh, therapy is effective for, a tremor and a rigidity, that kind of thing. Less effective for those things that dopamine uh, therapy is not effective for such as balance, but also the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's that dopamine replacement therapy doesn't help with either. Help us understand that correlation, why it winds up having that kind of one-to-one -one relationship with dopamine replacement therapy. Yeah, so uh, a lot of research has been done on the area of the brain that deep brain stimulation and dopamine replacement therapy affects. It's called the basal ganglia. It's a group of structures that lie deep inside the brain that provide the basis for generating those rhythms or, or helping to assist in the production of movements. The loss of, of dopamine in this area causes changes in the relationships between those different parts of the circuit. So it's as if you know, your computer, which has memory circuits, it has, uh, it has microprocessors, it has clocks to synchronize it with the outside world. Imagine if all of those parts which are now working in synchrony uh, because of the lack of, of chemicals, which of course computers don't need, but the brain does, those parts get out of synchronization. What deep brain stimulation does is to resynchronize those areas. And, um, and it does so because we're targeting the very same structures that dopamine affects. Now, Parkinson's disease is, a, is really a, a brain-wide disease. It doesn't just affect uh, the, uh, the basal ganglia, uh, which, which is something that we're finding out more and more uh, with each passing day. And dopamine does not just affect movement. It also affects other non-motor symptoms. Uh, as, a, as a great example, I'm sure many people have experienced side effects from uh, different kinds of dopamine replacement therapy in terms of changing mood or changing uh, 
their, their impulse control or other, or other things. And these are some of the non-motor symptoms. So we know that it affects circuits outside of the place where we're putting our DDS electrodes. And so uh, there's a lot of active research going on in that area to try to figure out where those other areas might be and how we might affect them as well. And we're going to be discussing over the course of our hour what some of those research possibilities are and the way in which you're looking for new targets that can affect some of those more difficult to, to uh, moderate uh, symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Um, but let's, let's go ahead. We see this note at the bottom that says, uh, while DBS can be transformative for some patients, it, it isn't right for everyone. And we'll talk more about what some of those concerns, why someone might not be a good candidate. But we're going to start by actually meeting someone who was a candidate. Um, and so let's bring Kevin Kwok into our, our uh, discussion uh, now. And um, Kevin, thanks again for joining us. And, and you're going to show us a little bit of video in just a moment about what yes. it's like for you when when um, DBS is working and what it's like for you when it's not. Um, but tell us first, you know, what your situation was. You were quite young when you first were diagnosed with Parkinson's in your, your mid to late 40s. And um, what were your primary symptoms at that point? Why was it after really a fairly short amount of time, four or five years, that you wanted to pursue DBS? Sure. Uh, you're, you're correct in that uh, I was diagnosed probably in my late 40s, but like all patients, likely exhibited symptoms well, well, well before that, but always attributed it to something else uh, in, in there. Uh, I would say that my course of early disease was, 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 was pretty mild, truthfully, relative to other patients that I've heard about. Um, and, and for the most part, I, I really, in the early days, uh, I, I sort of treated Parkinson's more as a speed bump, not really a, a you know a major obstacle. Uh, and you know, continued working, continued my career, continued so much of of what I did without even really not not necessarily hiding it, but also not really making a big deal out of it. Uh, but I think towards the fall of 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 um, 2013. Um, I started to really feel some of the other aspects of, 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 of Parkinson's, which kind of surprised me. Here, all of a sudden, was a happy-go-lucky kid who could deal with anything. All of a sudden, you know, sort of battling things that I that normally wouldn't bother me, and all of a sudden, they became more prominent. Uh, I sort of describe uh, Parkinson's as sort of a disease of irony, right? It takes great athletes, you know, who need motor function and, and removes it. Uh, it takes great minds and great comedians and actors, and you know, it takes away spontaneity. It, it takes CEOs that 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 need, you know, really astute executive function, uh, and and sometimes strips it away. And I and I sort of felt a little bit of all of those different avenues hitting. Um, and so for me, uh, there was a be, I mean, being in the biotech industry. I, I've predominantly always been someone who looked at developing new drugs for for diseases. Um, I never actually really thought about a medical or a surgical intervention, but a paper came out in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, in February of 2013, which described the use of DBS in a less severe patient group. So I took that to my physicians over at Stanford, and I said, you know, I'm starting to feel a little bit out of control and need to take control. I, I don't like my paranoid behaviors. I'm not sure if my disease is worsening and the drugs are causing it to worsen or is it the disease progression itself. Can you do something for me? You know, would I be a candidate? And they smiled at me and my neurologist said, you know, you are, you, 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 you'd be a likely candidate five, six, seven years from now, but I think it may be a little early, but I'll advocate for you. I don't think the surgeons will pick you, however. And so that was sort of the beginning of my exploration into whether or not DBS was right. And let me hold you there, Kevin. We'll come back and talk more about the, the fact that they did, in fact, select you and this interesting question about patient selection and, and have Dr. Henderson comment on that as well. But let's go ahead and take a look at your, your video uh, first. What we're, what, what we're about to see is um, what it's like for you when deep brain stimulation is not functioning. This is after you've right. had the procedure, but it's when it's turned off. So this is, in effect, what you're like when you don't have deep brain st stimulation working for you. So let's, let's take a look at that video now. Sure. So describe what we're seeing, Kevin. 
I'm just seeing the slide coming up uh, just now. There's a little bit of a lag here, so I'm, I'm not up yet. Do, do okay. other people have the slide up? Yeah, we see it. So what we see is your, your left hand, and it's moving very, very slowly. Yeah. Um, and this is what okay. it's like for you uh, when, when it's not uh, functioning. So can you see it now? I can't see it, but I can describe it. I, I, I've seen it before. The, f the first slide is, is off stimulation and off drug, and it literally is, I think, within 30 seconds of turning the stimulator off. Uh, uh, I go from you know full mobility and, and, and almost disease free to within 30 seconds looking like I had a stroke on my left side. And my my particular disease is only left sided, uh, so so for me you know this is a pretty profound effect and and and, and shows just how incapacitated I could be off stimulation. And in this particular video, I was laughing and smiling only because it's terrifying. But the fact is that I knew that they could turn it back on. I don't know if they have now comparing and contrasting this to the second slide or the second video, or is that not up yet? Yeah, let's go ahead now. Now we'll look at it with your stimulator turned on, and what we're seeing, right. Kevin, is uh, you, and now we're going to see your, your left hand again, and what we're seeing, what the audience is now seeing, our participants are seeing, is a very rapid finger tap, the rotating back and right. forth of your left hand, that test we all do with our neurologists, and you look like you're functioning at absolutely 100 percent it it pretty much is that you know my upds uh my, my unified um, parkinson's disease rating scores literally when they're off when you saw it in the first video you know we're in excess of 25 26 uh when you go back to putting it on almost within seconds i go down to you know less than four or five which my neurologist says is from, from a motor symptom side point almost disease free so it's a, it's a really market transition. So let's, let's push on to our, our next slide and ask Dr. Henderson to rejoin our uh, conversation. And um, we'll talk about what we both saw on the video and the fact that contrary to really what we see in this first bullet point, that most people opt to have DBS later in their disease, um, Kevin was someone, Dr. Henderson, who opted in um, and you as a surgical team decided that you would go with that. So describe that decision first, why it made sense for Kevin, even relatively early on in the disease, to have this procedure, and then give us your take also on, on what the audience was able to see with that you know, remarkable difference between the two videos. Yeah, it's, it really is remarkable, and uh, I think this is a, a good illustration of one of the adages that we've come to believe, and that is that early onset Parkinson's, meaning Parkinson's disease comes on in the, in the 40s or even 30s, uh, is generally, I would consider, a surgical disease. It, uh, it seems to respond very, very well to medication, often responds well to medication as well. But you know when somebody starts to exhibit symptoms that early that uh, things are going to become unmanageable over time, and most people get uh, maybe 10 or 12 years, good years out of medication, and then medications begin to fail. I've certainly seen people who have had a slower progression and have gone a lot longer than that. But, but for the most part, you, you, most of the people that we intervene with surgery have, have been on medicine about 10 years. Um, the study that Kevin mentioned uh, was a very influential one for us. Uh, it's, uh, I, I've always sort of believed that uh, an earlier intervention is probably better. And, uh, and that the brain maybe even learns how to be Parkinsonian, that if you intervene earlier, you may be able to somehow reduce or somewhat reduce the symptoms over the longer term. So I, I do think that we're now considering deep brain stimulation earlier and earlier uh, in the course of the disease. It's fascinating, and it uh, does represent quite a, quite a change in how we've all traditionally thought of that. Kevin, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I, I had always sort of had this misconception that, that DBS was what you say for end-stage patients. And, and um, But, you know, my mentality was that I, I like to ride bikes and I like to ride hills here in, in the Bay Area. And 
I always like to have extra gears when I ride a hill. It's just sort of mentally the thing that, that allows me to know that, hey, if I need to go to a granny gear, I have it. And I, and I was thinking that I'm expending all of that on drug therapy too early in my career. And frankly, I wanted to be around 20 years still riding my bike. And so this is sort of what was going through my mind. Fascinating um, uh, way to, to look at it. Lots of questions coming in already. I want to take a couple now before we get into new advances, and then in about 10 minutes or so, we'll turn to the subject of, of uh, focused ultrasound in addition. Um, but we're getting a lot of questions, Dr. Henderson, about what it treats and what it doesn't treat. We reviewed that briefly, that it's particularly effective with, with tremor and, and, and rigidity to date less effective with uh, gait and balance and some of the non-motor. But why don't you give us your own checklist for what you think DBS is particularly effective for and what it's not so effective for? Yeah, absolutely. The, the ideal surgical candidate is someone who has a good response to medication, who uh, doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to have tremor, but a prominent tremor component is often a good sign that, thing, that DBS is going to be helpful. Uh, rigidity is well treated. Tremor is well treated. Um, slowness of movement, as you saw in Kevin's video, is, is also often well treated. And those are the, the big three, the big triad of things that we tell people they can almost universally expect will get better with DBS. The things that are a little less certain are uh, freezing, and uh, we've, we've seen this in our own practice and a number of papers in the literature have shown that it, the, the response for, for gait freezing is quite variable. Uh, about 50% of people may not have much effect on their gait freezing, but uh, in some cases it's really quite dramatic. It, uh, it does not treat uh, some of the uh, less, less prominent or even the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. For example, speech problems. People who have difficulty with speech, uh, that never, in my experience, improves with, uh, with surgery or very rarely does and does sometimes get worse. So we worry a little bit about people who have pre-existing speech problems. Balance issues. So if you have frequent falls, if they're due to your balance rather than to freezing, you, uh, pr you probably aren't going to get much improvement from DBS. Um, and, and again, we, we do look for a good medication response. So the perfect candidate is someone who, when they're off medication, is frozen and immobile and, and has a hard time moving when they're on medication uh, is very close to normal but has abnormal involuntary movements or dyskinesia and that there are still some times during the day when they're very close to normal with no, with no dyskinesia and with, uh, and with good motor function but that those times, those periods are getting uh, shorter and shorter and less frequent. So that's sort of the ideal candidate for surgery. Now we do depart from that. We get, there's, there's uh, you know, I, I think surgery can benefit many people, but in terms of just ideally, uh, that, that sort of person who fits that description is almost guaranteed to do well with DBS. And again, mm -hmm. the, the correlation, the reason why you look for someone who has traditionally done well on medication is because there is this correlation between how dopamine replacement therapy works in the brain and the way in which DBS uh, uh, targets uh, its impact as well. And, and that correlation is, is something that is a predictor uh, then for, for who could be a good candidate. Uh, let me just ask a couple of other quick questions, and then we want to move on to uh, some of the promising uh, advances you're looking to do in, in research. Um, question coming in about how long the effects uh, last. There's been some research about this in recent years as well, Dr. Henderson, right, that initially it was thought maybe it buys you six, seven years. There's some thought now that the, the effect of having DBS surgery can last longer still. Is that correct? Well, it, you know, we we believe as a field, and I think the, the literature is continuing to show this, that it's not that DBS stops working. Uh, it continues to provide you with, with good improvement, it's, but the disease does continue to progress. So uh, the improvements are long-lasting, but the, it, it only provides a, an improvement above your baseline and not a cure. It's important to remember that this is not a cure for right. disease. It's a therapy that can improve uh, your outcome, but we, but it doesn't seem as if over time the, the results drop off very much. Uh, but the things that do continue to progress are things like speech difficulty, gait problems, and cognitive function. Those are the three big things that 
uh, that begin to affect people who have had DBS for a long time, whereas the rigidity, slowness of movement, and tremor continue to be reasonably well treated, but not as well because their underlying motor function is continuing. And reasonably well treated um, for beyond six or seven years? Uh, certainly, we, I mean, we have uh, patients, in, I have patients in my own practice who have been implanted for uh, almost 15 years now, and uh, they continue to have improvement from their from their DBS systems and come back for battery replacements, uh, despite the and fact let me that ask they, about the let me ask about the cognition question, um, because that's, of course, in the end, everyone's greatest concern about Parkinson's in, in general, I, I think, in the end, is, is you know, whether or not I will have a, a, an effect, uh, this will have an effect on my cognitive abilities. And I think the question comes up in two different ways. One is, it's suggested on the slide here that um, someone who's already experiencing some cognitive impairment is not a good candidate. I'd like you to tell me why. That may seem like an obvious question, but I think it's important for us to understand why that would not be a good candidate. But also there's a couple of people who have uh, um, typed in their questions have raised the question of whether or not DBS can make cognitive, can, can lead to cognitive problems. Um, mm -hmm. So could you tackle both of those questions, Dr. Henderson? Absolutely. Uh, so you know, let me answer your second question first in saying that DBS certainly can make cognition worse. Usually the problems with cognition are short-lived and self-limited and improve. However, uh, up to 30% of people may have some long-term uh, decrease, particularly in, in verbal fluency. That's one of the, the things that uh, has in, in various studies has continued to come out as a as a uh, kind of universal potential problem as, as decreases in verbal fluency, uh, word finding difficulties, uh, having a tougher time putting sentences together. Uh, this this is something that we do see, and people who have a tendency towards that before surgery may be at higher risk, and that's why we uh, always do detailed neuropsychological testing before we do before we do surgery. Yeah. This is Kevin, uh, and it, can, if I can chime in, uh, the cognition, uh, the loss of speech and, and executive function w w really c what concerned me the most in my considerations. You know, this is how I make a living, and I, I, I had sort of these visions of coming back as Forrest Gump, right? You know, where I, I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't speak, I, and, fr and frankly, it, 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 it terrified me uh, in, in there. But. Uh, I think so much of what we're learning is still somewhat new, but I know, Dr. Henderson, you sort of reassured me that, you know, being younger, being healthier, you know, having a better baseline actually potentially could minimize that side effect, and, and I think that that did play itself out. Absolutely, Ken. I'm glad you brought that up because it's another consideration in, in our shifting emphasis on potentially doing the, these operations earlier rather than later in the course of the disease where people do have more reserve, uh, are able to tolerate the, the operation better, and, uh, and we may have less of an effect on, uh, on cognition and other problems. What is very interesting, though, uh, uh, what, I'm sorry? Uh, sorry, Kevin, if, if you could just hold that thought for a moment. I, I, sure. I want us to um, go ahead and, and advance to sort of the new developments in, in DBS research and spend a, a few minutes on this. We'll come back and take more questions on this topic and more of our participant questions, but I want to review where we are with the current state of DBS research um, and then so that we can and then engage on the topic of, of ultrasound and then we'll start taking more of our participant um, questions. But we see up on the slide here um, uh, some, a couple of really interesting things that are, are, are going on. We see a, a series of points under something called closed loop and then something at the bottom called steerable. Um, and these, Dr. Henderson, are, are advances that you are looking into and that Kevin is actually participating in as well in terms of research. And that is that the electrodes that you implant in the brain that send out those currents of electricity that modulate and moderate symptoms, that, that same electrical device can be used to actually record what's going on in the brain. And this gets back, Dr. Henderson, to what we talked about initially, that part of what we really need to understand 
is what's going on with these electrical surges in the brain. And tell us what you're hoping to understand by recording those waves and how that perhaps will help us refine the techniques of DBS that much further. Well, let, let me first emphasize that this slide is the tiniest possible snapshot of all the different things that are going on in the field. So uh, we're going to focus on these two topics today, but uh, I want everyone to realize that there's a lot more than this going on, where there's uh, the exploration of different targets, there's uh, people are looking at different stimulation types rather than the continuous stimulation that we currently use. There, there's a whole host of things, including understanding how we target, where we target, and, and what those uh, brain connections look like. But I think it is important to, to try to cone it down a little bit and talk about a couple of these areas. And so let, I'll, I'll first take the, your, your question on the closed loop stimulation, which uh, I think is, is a fascinating topic. Currently, deep brain stimulation works continuously. We're always putting a continuous stream of low voltage pulse electricity into the brain. If we could find the markers in the brain, the signals that indicate when symptoms are worsening or when they're improving, because the brain does work on rhythms and patterns, as I think almost everyone who suffers with Parkinson's disease knows, uh, your, your state varies during the day. Sometimes you're feeling much better, sometimes you're feeling much worse, regardless of your medication state. And so if we could read these brain states out and change the stimulation to match what's going on, we could uh, improve the efficiency of the stimulation, making batteries last longer. We could improve potentially the efficacy of the stimulation by uh, only stimulating in the areas that we need and at the times that we need. So. Uh, one of the things that my team is investigating with Kevin's help is uh, trying to look at what those brain signals look like. And uh, what do I mean by this? Well, we uh, record electrically from the implanted electrodes, just as you mentioned, Dave, and we display that recording on a screen that uh, if anyone's ever seen uh, – a spectrogram, it's where, for example, music or sound is spread across an entire spectrum. We can color code that, and we can see that the various frequency bands, just like you'd use a graphic equalizer to adjust the, the sound on your stereo, uh, we can see that some of those frequency bands are more prominent than others in Parkinson's. And we're beginning to learn that, uh, that these are abnormal, they're not present uh, normally, and they go away when you treat with medication. So by using these, different frequency bands as triggers for deep brain stimulation, which we haven't gotten to that stage yet. We're still in the exploratory phase trying to figure out how they correlate with Parkinson's symptoms. Uh, we think we could uh, really improve how deep brain stimulation is done. So it really would make it a kind of a much more personalized, a sort of DBS on demand kind of system, which would have not only the effect of it being a longer lived battery, but also the goal would be that the DBS that's in Kevin Kwok might be different than the DBS that's in another one of your patients, that, that each one is fine-tuned to fit a particular individual? Absolutely. I, mean, that, I think that's a great way to summarize it. Yeah, this is, as, as a patient, I think of this as almost a um, like a fingerprint, an electrical fingerprint in the brain. And, and then matching up the right currency to personalize it. And briefly on the on what's with steerable, I'm sorry to be pushing us along here, but we want to uh, cover as much ground as we can. Sure. So let me talk a little bit about that technology. This is, this is being developed uh, by a number of companies and being worked on by several different research groups. The idea here is that the, the deep brain stimulation electrodes currently have four electrodes or four contacts on them. Those contacts are like little metal cylinders that are a, a little more than, they're about a, a millimeter and a quarter in diameter, so about the size of a pencil head. Uh, we have a limited ability then to use those uh, contacts to stimulate because when you put electricity through them, it spreads in essentially a spherical mm -hmm. pattern. The uh, targets that we use for deep brain stimulation are very close to many different vital functions. They're close to pathways for uh, sensation, for movement, 
for speech and for cognition and for emotion. And so as we turn that stimulation up in order to affect your Parkinsonian symptoms, we may inadvertently also cause side effects. One way around this is to, uh, is to develop leads that have, instead of cylinders, they have uh, contacts that go all the way around in a pattern that allows you to steer the electricity so that we can, uh, for example, move it away from uh, tingling. If you're getting tingling when the stimulator is on, we can steer it so that you don't get that any longer. If you're getting speech problems, we may be able to steer it so you're not having that problem. So uh, we think this could be a huge advance, uh, if, especially if coupled with software to visualize the effects of the stimulation in three dimensions could really, uh, could really help guide our programming and improve the efficacy. And it sounds in some ways that these, these two, although obviously different uh, areas of research really w would very much work hand in hand because the goal in, in both is to make things more personable, personal rather, and and have a more personalized effect, and also you know moderate uh, the the side effects so that we're we're essentially developing the next generation of of DBS, one that's much more fine tuned, much more precise for each person's particular needs. Let's look next at, at what some of the hopes are for where this um, uh, next generation of DBS um, may go. So uh, again, what we're looking at here are, are, this is sort of the geography part of this, right, Jamie Henderson? This is where not only are we fine tuning what the nature of these signals are, when they occur, and how to more uh, aptly modulate them in an individualized way. We're also looking at the geography of the brain to see if there are other places where we could direct this current that might then affect uh, some of these symptoms that have been more problematic to uh, assist. So is the thinking here that something like gait that, and balance that's been very difficult to fix that what we that this is where geography matters that that if we could find the right target then the same kind of stimulation might impact that symptom as well absolutely dave it's uh, as they say in real estate right location 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 uh, <laughs> and to keep us moving i'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this slide but i just want to mention that uh, there's a lot of exciting research going on because we have so much experience with deep brain stimulation in the standard targets that we normally use uh, many people are feeling that it's relatively safe to explore some of these other targets if they have good theoretical basis. And so uh, you mentioned one area called the peduncular pontine nucleus, or PPN. This is uh, being, being investigated by several groups uh, as a, uh, a treatment for gait and walking. The jury's still out as to whether it actually works or not, and uh, it's a very difficult area to target, not only because it's hard to see, hard to find, but there's also a lot of side effects that could be uh, induced by that target. So we're, we're still still looking into that particular region. Treating pathways is, to me, one of the most exciting new concepts in deep brain stimulation, uh, and that is instead of putting the electrode in a, in a location, and we talk about the STN or subthalamic nucleus, we talk about the GPI or the globus pallidus interna, we talk about the PPN, these are all uh, locations, their, their houses along the street. If, if, uh, if we would instead like to affect all of the traffic going in and out of that, we don't want to put the, the lead in a neighborhood. We want to put it on a superhighway. We want to affect that, uh, the way that that information flows to, to large areas of the brain. And this is uh, something that I'm personally very excited about in doing research in, is finding out how we can affect large areas of the brain with, uh, by stimulating along these superhighways of information in the brain. And what's particularly, I think, fascinating about that is that it, it may be those highways, those pathways as you describe them, rather than the actual houses in the neighborhood that might be able to bring about improvement in things such as cognitive decline. Uh, with that last bullet point, and of course, again, the thing that probably most of us um, in the end uh, worry about the most. Let's hold our conversation on, on DBS um, here. We'll come back and take more of your questions about that. But we want to bring uh, Dr. Neil Cassell back into our conversation at this point and, and take up this other interesting avenue of, of new um, uh, brain treatments 
a called focused ultrasound. Um, Dr. Cassell, thanks again for being part of our, our conversation. And let's just dig right into it. Um, this is a, a non-invasive procedure. You're not actually having to undergo surgery. Uh, but tell us uh, more about what um, focus ultrasound actually allows you to do, what the target is, and how that can be helpful for people with Parkinson's. Sure. And uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, let me frame my comments by uh, setting some expectations. Whereas uh, DBS is the gold standard, it's a proven uh, treatment that is good and getting better, focused ultrasound, where it has enormous potential, is experimental. It's in clinical trials, and we thank Michael J. Fox Foundation for helping us support some of those trials. So the way focused ultrasound works is that in an awake patient with no incisions uh, in the scalp or holes in the head, in the skull, multiple beams of ultrasound energy are focused on a point deep in the brain with a high degree of precision and accuracy. Uh, we're talking about submillimeter precision and accuracy. And this is analogous to using a magnifying glass to focus beams of light and burn on a point and burn a hole in a leaf. But with focused ultrasound, where each of the individual beams pass through the tissue, it has no effect. But at the focal point where those beams converge, it heats and destroys only the targeted tissue without damaging the nearby cells. And that targeted tissue is very similar to the target in deep brain stimulation, only rather than sending an electrical current, in this case you're actually burning a point or, or creating a lesion. Tell us why that's uh, an interesting alternative, because there's some history to this. I mean, in some ways, focus ultrasound is, is also a kind of second generation. We were talking about new generations of DBS. In some ways, focus ultrasound is the next generation of surgical procedures that used to be done, pallidotomy and others. So why is this idea of, of creating a lesion, which in some ways sounds a bit scary, why is that um, a useful alternative to consider? Right. Well, before DBS existed, the, the, the standard of care was to make lesions either in the thalamus for Parkinsonian tremor or in the, uh, the GPI, as you suggested, for uh, rigidity or dyskinesia. And then DBS came along and lesioning uh, became passe. So now focused ultrasound is a non-surgical approach for creating those lesions. And uh, the, alter the other non-surgical approach is radiosurgery, the gamma knife, which uses multiple intersecting beams of uh, gamma rays from cobalt-60 sources. But there are obvious advantages of focused ultrasound. It, is, it doesn't have any of the complications of surgery, such as infection or hemorrhage or damage to the brain by the electrode. Uh, and it has the advantages over radiation in that the effect is immediate, number one. And number two, it can be tested. You can test to confirm that you're in the correct location. And is the benefit from it analogous to the current form of DBS? In other words, good for tremor, good for rigidity, good for slowness? That remains to be proven. As, a, as I said, this is in clinical trials now, a uh, trial ongoing for Tremor, another three trials ongoing for uh, the dyskinesia and the, and the lack of coordination and rigidity and so on. The suspicion or the hope is that it will be good, but only for certain patients. This is not for everyone. Gold, uh, uh, DBS will continue to be the gold standard, but there are a substantial number of patients who either because of concomitant medical conditions or because they choose not to have a surgical intervention could be candidates for focused ultrasound. 
But the trials are early stage, they're ongoing, um, and it remains to be seen. Clearly, we're hopeful that this will end up being a great alternative for a subset of patients with Parkinson's disease. We see at the, the, the bottom point uh, kind of a footnote on the slide, Dr. Cassell, that says it's important to note that lesioning uh, from focused ultrasound is, is permanent and irreversible. So unlike DBS, which could be turned on and, and off, once it's done, it's done. Uh, which is a cautionary note. On the other hand, that's potentially one of its advantages, right? Because it's it's done. You you don't have to get a battery swap in in three to five years. Exactly. So that that is a, a potential real advantage. It's a one-time event. It's substantially l less expensive than DBS, but you can't tune it. You know, once you once it's done, it's done. And as far as who would be candidates for this, you mentioned people might be candidates who either don't want to have surgery or who have perhaps circulatory or bleeding problems, so surgery isn't a good idea for them. Would What are the other candidate criteria? Obviously, again, in clinical trials, so I know we don't know all of these answers yet, but is the assumption that candidates for this procedure would be similar to candidates for DBS in terms of their, that they have been, you know, responsive to uh, dopamine replacement therapy, that they haven't had cognitive issues, same sort of criteria? That's correct. All right. Um, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Cassell. Please stay can, with us. Can I make one more comment? Yeah, and please. we've been talking about uh, focused ultrasound as a way to treat the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, but it should be noted, as one of the bullet points on the slide points out, that there is a substantial amount of research ongoing to use focused ultrasound as a way to deliver drugs deep in the brain in very high concentrations, either genes or growth factors, or even stem cells to treat the underlying disease. But these are very early studies, but people are very excited about that research. No, thanks for, for bringing that up. I'm sorry I skipped over that. That's that second to the last uh, bullet point, which is a fascinating possibility that's long been such an obstacle in Parkinson's and in other conditions, of course, as well, to be able to cross the blood brain barrier, and if focus ultrasound could make that more permeable, um, then, uh, then obviously there's, there's lots of fascinating possibilities um, with that. So uh, let's move to our questions. Dr. Cassell, stay with us. Rejoining us, Dr. Henderson and Kevin Kwok, and we'll, we'll use the balance of our time to take questions about both DBS and focus ultrasound. A lot of people are raising the question, and perhaps both of you, Dr. Cassell and Dr. Henderson, can respond to this, about whether or not these could be used together. In other words, could you have DBS and then later on have focus ultrasound? Is there a way in which these two procedures could be used um, in conjunction with each other? Dr. Cassell first. It's it's uh, possible to do focused ultrasound on one side and DBS on the other side. Dr. Henderson, and, anything uh, to add on that on that question? Yeah, absolutely. I, in fact, I, I would expand a little bit in saying that uh, right now the, the high frequency or high intensity focused ultrasound allows us to make lesions in the brain, but there's also a low intensity variety. And that low-intensity ultrasound modulates brain circuits without actually lesioning them. And to me, this is extremely exciting because it allows one to, for example, uh, test a target before you place a lead there by modulating it with ultrasound. Or if you have a DBS lead in place, modulating a different area of the brain that's complementary to that area with focused ultrasound. So we're, we're uh, you know, here at Stanford, we're beginning to explore a lot of these different interactions between different modalities of energy and how they might affect the brain differently. So fascinating research area. And, and Dr. Cassell, I guess the other way to think about this from the patient community's point of view is that, you know, this is just one more arrow in the quiver, right? I mean, as many tools as we can have available is, is in the end a plus for the, the patient community. You know, you took the words literally out of my mouth. I was just about to say, focused ultrasound is just another arrow in the quiver. And there's a variety of treatments, and it has to be tailored to the patient. And 
where the patients will do best in the long run are in centers where all these modalities are available and the surgeon's agnostic as to which technology is to be used just with the benefit of the patient being the primary consideration. Yeah, great point. A uh, question from Robin, and Kevin, maybe you can uh, uh, take this one. Um, it, it, Robin asks, is there a benefit to adjusting uh, your DBS stimulator to address different issues? She's particularly interested in, in gait and, and Jamie Henderson, perhaps you can yeah. take that. But Kevin, what about for you? What's been your experience with having to make adjustments? Well, one of the things that I think is, needs to be pointed out is it's not just the surgery in, in DBS that's important. It's the, it's the year after of, of fine tuning. Uh, and so we are constantly, you know, coming back and every couple of months when I'm in, playing with different, you know, diff, different lead points, uh, and also different, um, voltages on, on there. And you, you see market differences, you know, when you do that. And I think they're still titrating to the exact perfect effect. And, and Jamie Henderson, chime in on, on how important it is for patients to be advocates in terms of getting that fine-tuning done and what fine-tuning itself can provide. Absolutely. The, despite the fact that we only have four contacts, we also have a huge range of different parameters that we can change with the deep brain stimulator. So uh, there are a lot of different adjustments that can be made, and many of them have effects that are not very good, and many of them have effects that are. And the only way to know that is to really explore that space. And uh, it can be difficult. In some patients, in some cases, the, the first simulation, the first programming works really well, but in others it takes a long time. So it's, uh, it's very important to continue to try to adjust it to get your best results. A number of questions coming in on battery life. Uh, Jamie Henderson, can you respond to that? And again, this, of course, takes us to the new efforts to create something. If you could have it be something that was more B, uh, DBS on demand, uh, it would extend battery life. But until we get to that point, what's the current state of, of battery life for DBS? I usually tell people it's three to five years, and uh, it really is right in that range. Most people are getting their batteries replaced somewhere in the three to four year range. We have a few people getting five. I've just recently uh, replaced someone's battery who's, who's gotten seven years out of it. So uh, it's, but for the most part, three to four years is what we would normally expect. Now there is a rechargeable version of, of, of the stimulator uh, that I should mention, uh, which is an option if, uh, if you ha have a very short interval between battery changes or if, uh, or for people who uh, would prefer that option. The battery lasts nine years, but it's it's a lot more hassle. It's a lot more uh, to use and to and to keep track of. And and if you let it discharge, then uh, sometimes the battery is has to be replaced anyway. So again, there is an like, option that's rechargeable. Sort of like having an electric car. It's, you have to, you have to be careful about how, far, how far you go. Um, uh, Dr. Casella, a question about um, the risks of focus ultrasound on speech, again, because you're still in clinical trial. I know it's hard to know the answers for this kind of specific question, but we heard that come up with DBS uh, as a worry often about speech. Where, how, how would that play out, do you think, with, with focus ultrasound? We're making lesions on one side with focus ultrasound. Uh, the feeling in the community is that this won't be a substantial risk in the past, when lesions were made on both sides, there were issues with speech, to be sure. But that was in the era before there were really these high-resolution uh, MR scans and much better targeting. So that may be less of a problem. Uh, clearly, the way the uh, clinical trials are evolving are first to do the uh, make lesions on only one side. Once that is demonstrated to be safe, then people will move on to making lesions on both sides and see how that goes. Okay. Um, a question about whether or not you could upgrade from your current DBS, if you have one, uh, to the new uh, closed loop uh, variety of, of DBS once those become available. Could you, could you upgrade to a, a new system? And if you can, I, I'm, I'm betting that Kevin Kwok would be first in line. 
<laughs> I'm actually involved well, me, in that, in the, in the new protocol to look at that. Uh, I think thanks to the Fox Foundation, they've sponsored a new a new closed loop study, and uh, I've just moved from one one clinical trial to the next one, uh, looking at the closed loop. And let, this is uh, Dr. Anderson. Let me add that uh, Kevin's the the pacemaker that Kevin has implanted has that capability, and it it uh, it currently. Uh, is is not turned on. That's something that has to be done in firmware, basically. But uh, but the there it, as as a participant in the clinical study, he's one of the very few people who have this what we call the brain radio implanted. So his his uh, his pacemaker is very high tech. And so um, that leads to the question of, of so Kevin in, in effect you know has it in place. It's just that the all the systems aren't figured out. So it could be that on demand a, a, a kind of enterprise um, question coming in about how long will it be until that sort of more personalized on demand form of DBS is available. Well, uh, uh, Jamie, do you want to handle it? I will. Yeah. So uh, the question with any sort of speculative question is, is always, I don't know, is the, is the answer. We feel like we're making very good progress. I think uh, because of participation of, of people like Kevin who uh, really dedicate themselves to helping us with the research endeavor, we're able to find out just incredible amounts of information about how the brain is working. Uh, how long it's going to take us to actually implement that as a closed loop system is hard to say. But I think within the next five years, we'll probably see something along those lines. Um, one person wants to know, it's kind of a, an interesting uh, question about if you if you have side effects from DBS, sometimes there's tingling, some people have brought off speech. If you turn off your DBS, do those side effects then go away? Uh, well, for the most part, yes. It, there, there are some very rare individuals in whom uh, the placement of the wire itself can lead to problems. I, I've only seen that in a couple of instances, and in those cases, sometimes removing the wire can reverse the symptoms, but that's exceedingly rare. I've only seen that in a couple of instances. For the most part, the answer is yes. Turning it off or, or adjusting it can eliminate those, those bad side effects. And Dr. Cassell, just as people want to know when that new on-demand form of DBS will be available, uh, same speculative question about about focus ultrasound. I know, again, you're in clinical trials, uh, but uh, if all goes well, I guess uh, what what would be what would be a reasonable expectation, I guess, for for patients to think as to when focus ultrasound may be an actual realistic alternative. Optimistically, three years. Uh, perhaps more conservatively, five years. Great. Um, Kevin, we're, we're approaching the end of our time, and I, and, and I think it would be appropriate for you to say something about um, your experience, not only as someone who has DBS, but about your decision to participate in research itself. And, and yeah. you know, this is something we come back to so often, not only in these webinars, but in courses uh, of discussions within the patient con community generally about the importance of participating in research. Would you, would you say a word about that, please? Sure, sure. Um, you know, I'm actually very sober about what DBS has, has given to me and, and the fact that, you know, in my, it's not for everyone, but in my particular case, it really worked well. And, and, and so my, my, my focus now is really on, on, on research to, um, you know, further improve modalities of, 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 of some form of surgical intervention. Uh, but I'm also now very involved, and I think it is truly the ultimate form of control uh, as a patient, right? We, you know, by getting involved in clinical trials, um, this allows us really uh, access to what I think are the best minds in the world looking at this problem, and I feel really fortunate to be part of a of a team at Stanford that really is helping me get there. Uh, but I'm also starting to think about other aspects of research and getting involved in in you know ways of living with DB. Uh, sorry, with, with Parkinson's, and so um, you know in a way I've come full circle, right? As a, as a biotech executive that used to live off the backs of other patient volunteers. I find myself now oddly and ironically in the same position of giving back, uh, and, I, and I think it's the greatest form of, 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 of control that we can do. Kevin, thank you. Um, good note, I think, to, to 
bring our, our, our session to a close. We'll see if we can put up a last um, um, slide um, up for people to, to see if, the, if they're interested in, in participating um, in research. We would encourage everyone to go to foxtrialfinder.org where you can um, put down the kind of things you're interested in, where you live, what particular sort of research you'd like to participate in, and this is a kind of matching system that will make available, make available to you the research options where you uh, happen to live. Um, I really want to thank um, uh, Kevin, along with Dr. Henderson and Dr. Cassell, for their participation um, in this webinar, for continuing to add more arrows to our, our, our quiver uh, for all of us in the, in the Parkinson's uh, community. Thank you for the good work that you do, and thank you for being a part of our program uh, today. Um, we'll be sending a link uh, to this webinar on demand so you can uh, listen to it. Again, there will also be a survey link in that email, um, and we hope you'll share your thoughts on, on our presentation today and on, and on our third, uh, Thursday webinar a series in general. The more feedback we get, the better able we are to, uh, to fine-tune and, and, and improve what it is um, that we offer. And we hope you'll mark our cal your calendars for our next uh, third Thursday webinar, which will be on April the 16th at 12 noon Eastern. We're going to talk about new ways um, we can measure uh, Parkinson's from all those new iPhone apps uh, to uh, uh, genomic uh, sequencing. And so just go to michaeljfox.org slash webinars for more information on that. Um, last, just a reminder that um, if we didn't get to your question today, and we know there were many we didn't get to, um, uh, join us tomorrow at noon on, on uh, Twitter. Uh, hashtag is FoxPDChat when Dr. Rachel Dolan from the Fox Foundation will take up more questions about new uh, brain uh, treatments for Parkinson's um, disease. So uh, for all of us um, at the Fox Foundation, my colleagues uh, Maggie McGuire and, and uh, Kim Sawicki do such a great job of putting these um, gatherings together. And again, to Dr. Drs. Henderson and Cassell and to Kevin Kwok, um, our thanks. And we wish everyone a great day. I'm Dave Iverson. <laughs>